Today we start with uh, Minkat and David Aldos. Uh, Minkat is a freelance game designer, narrative designer, and uh, she's kind of a, a renaissance kind of uh, intellectual woman, like uh, doing all sorts of things and mixing them together, which is really, really cool. And David started like a uh, special effect designer. He was a set designer and then moved to escape room design, which is super cool. I really love escape room. I played uh, their ex escape room Oubliette in London, and it was amazing. It was really, really one of the best experiences in uh, es escape room of my life. So. Uh, give a warm welcome to Minkat and David. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming along. And uh, did you all have a lovely time yesterday as well? Yeah. It's that 9.45 in the morning energy that we've all got. <laughs> it's great. Yes. <laughs> um, how do we move the slides on? Uh, oh. it's just okay, cool. <laughs> so, yeah, um, thanks for the uh, lovely introduction. Um, so, uh, we are Ubiet, and we're going to be talking to you about escape rooms and some of the stuff we've learnt and some of the stuff that inspires us. And this... This here is Minket. There's a smaller version here. Um, <laughs> Mink is a game designer of uh, board games and street games and digital games and room escape games. And if you can fit game onto the end of a, another word, then Mink has probably designed it. <laughs> Hello. Um, and this is Big Dave. And Dave is, by day, he is a graphic designer and he does, makes motion graphics for television programs like Horrible History and a lot of news channels. Um, and, but by night, he is an installation artist, uh, maker and doer, and likes building things. And so he has also, also obviously came into making escape rooms as well. So we combined our talents to become Oubliette. Oh, sorry. So that's a picture of me. <laughs> And that's me saying hello. Hello. So these are the four escape rooms that we've made. Uh, Spark of Resistance was in America. Uh, Framed, which was for the Alibi TV channel. Uh, New P escape from New Palasia, which was the first one we made as Oubliette. And the Dyson Smart Rooms. Um, so we're going to start talking about the bottom two, Escape from New Palasia and Dyson Smart Rooms. Uh, so um, who here has played an escape room? Ah, not, not everyone. Who knows about escape rooms? Okay. So well. we're going to pretend that one person didn't put their hand up <laughs> so that we can tell you what escape rooms are. So um, basically, um, you and your crack team of friends have uh, get into a room, you're locked in, you have 60 minutes to figure out what the hell is going on. Everything in the room is a puzzle or a clue uh, to help you or something that may set you back or um, some other kind of challenge. You have to get out of the room. That's basically what an escape room game is. And they've been popping up all over the place. They, they're incredibly popular and they've had a really quick escalation in how many there are. Um, and so one of the reasons for this is it's pretty low barrier to entry to actually make one. Um, so you, uh, you kind of just need these few things. You need a room to escape from, some puzzles, some stuff like furniture, objects, uh, timer generally, normally about like 60 minutes people put on the timer, and uh, a theme. And so that's kind of how to make an escape room in general. But if you want to make a good escape room, it's slightly more involved. Um, there's a, we could go through this, but yeah, there's, there's a difference Should between just making it. it. No. <laughs> we are not going to go through this. That, that would be the entire time. Um, but yeah, so if you uh, want to make a, a good escape room, there are a lot more considerations. And you, you don't all have to be exactly the same as well. Uh, and there's also expectations of what an escape room is. So, yeah, a whole bunch of stuff that, you know, when you go in, you kind of want out of the room. When we go in, we kind of want out of the room. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, surprising. 
an escape room, it's probably actually going to be multiple rooms. That, that just gets more and more exciting as you open more doors. Um, a uh, self-contained game. So if you go into the game, you don't really want to expect to you know, have a puzzle that expects you to know pi to nine digits just to get to the next stage. So um, no outside knowledge you know, should go into the room. Uh, you can't uh, talk to anyone outside of the game. Uh, well, you can, but... It's kind of rude, and it sort of breaks the immersion if you're on your phone during a game. It sort of ruins it for everyone else that you're playing with. So generally, you're only with the people you are with at that moment. Uh, ideally, you're going to complete all the puzzles before the time runs out, or you're going to have an awkward you know, couple of days standing around doing nothing, <laughs> stuck on that last puzzle. And the theme, which is a big thing for us, uh, we like the idea that the theme uh, extends all-encompassing to, uh, you know, create a story. So uh, we'll just now go into a bit more detail about two of our rooms. The first one we're going to talk about is Escape from New Pelagia, um, which uh, we've got a video of. Let's see. So if you happy to go. play. Ah. There we go. So we tried to kind of create quite an atmospheric room. We had characters in costume. Um, the, the players would have to solve quite very physical large object puzzles um, and interact with these strange machines. <laughs> um. This is a room that we made down in South London uh, last year. So if anyone's South London crew, um, yeah, South uh, London crew. You can't go because it's not there anymore. Yeah, but it, it, it also closed down. Yeah. Um, so we kind of can't. It's almost like we, we can't really give spoilers because the game's over. So it's, it's no point in giving spoilers. But um, so yeah. So it turns out at the end of the game, uh, you it, one of the wall explodes and you break out through the side. Um, so that's what how. Um, so. As the kind of as the um, video kind of gives a, a small indication of, we we wanted to create um, a world that I guess we call it like a retro future dystopia. So somewhere um, that had kind of strains of what we know. It's kind of sci-fi, but um, it's it's a sci-fi as if you know we had gone down a parallel path at some point. Uh, we were very inspired by. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Got a Brazil fan in the room. Yeah. We um, does ha, have, has everyone or has anyone not seen the film Brazil? So all right, cool. We're we're all in a good place here. Um, yeah, it's it's an absolutely beautiful film. Um, the the. We took into account um, when we were creating the room, you know, we, we were thinking all about the idea of uh, kind of being in a, a society uh, that was, we were, it was being looked over by, um, you know, a, a kind of big regime, uh, but it was maybe not the best kind of organized society in the world. And Brazil just really kind of, uh, fits in beautifully with, with what we were thinking. There's, uh, you know, the, visually and in terms of the kind of, there's a lot of interesting themes. Whether it's a totally coherent kind of set of themes, I'm not sure, but it's, um, it, it certainly throws a whole lot of, uh, through a whole lot of influences our way. And it's, uh, it's 1984, which is a very sort of bleak dystopia, but it's also made by Monty Python, so it's got a lot of humor to it as well. And so whilst we haven't made it, it wasn't a carbon copy of that film, we wanted to have that feeling of, this is a, really is like a, a quite a strict, like unpleasant dystopia, but also have the levity and have some kind of humor, a, a dark humor running through it as well. 
and we we wanted it to, to feel like uh, you have been just dropped into the middle of a film. I, uh, it's so the re other really nice thing about escape rooms is that they're not you, you don't tend, it's not just people who are who you think of as, as gamers who play it, and it's not just people who maybe are theatre goers um, who play. But it, uh, it, so it's kind of uh, it's open to a lot more people than those those particular sort of groups. But everybody, I mean, irrespective of how much theatre or how much how much literature you've read, uh, you know. Everybody likes the idea that they might kind of they would be dropped into a film and be the hero of a film. Um, so I think that's what a lot of Roomscapes kind of you know they play on that that desire. Um, so we wanted to take it a little bit further than just uh, to telling you that you were in a film. We want it to really feel like you were. And there's lots of kind of subtle subliminal clues. Um, there's a visual language to to. To film that, as viewers, we even if we're not aware of it, we all know we actually can recognise them and know they're there and have that, those subliminal hints. So, um, a big influence on not really, but you know, <laughs> um, it even comes down to the way that you look at um, the colours in the room. You know, every detail, even to that level. So. Um, as, as you may know that you know that in within films uh, you put you typically nowadays a film will be graded color graded to create a certain mood and atmosphere um, this is probably one of the most phenomenal examples ever if you notice in the orange and teal effect in Michael Bay's amazing Transformers 2 uh, once you notice it, you just cannot not notice it. Um, but it can be used in more subtle ways, just to kind of evoke a certain atmosphere. And you know, so we were thinking about things like this: like you're looking at this kind of uh, uh, military institution. Uh, well, it's a Stasi institution from the lives of others, which was also a big influence on us. And uh, but you're not just looking at kind of you know uh, blank and uh, white and green walls. Everything is kind of being filtered through the the, the, the camera and uh, the grading, and and they they're creating extra tones there. So that's kind of a long lead-in to say we even thought about like what green we wanted, whether it was going to be a kind of natural green or are you going to um, kind of give it a bit of a yellow wash just to give an extra kind of uh, evocation, is that a word, of, um, of being in, a film, in the film world? Uh, so we, we, we graded our paint, paint samples. Um, so one of the kind of heavy hitters in immersive theatre, most people have heard of Punch Drunk. Um, and we were huge Punch Drunk fans uh, when we were younger and we just, we loved them so much that we actually went and volunteered to help be design assistants. And when we, so we spent a couple of years helping build the sets and do the set design for Punch Drunk shows. Um, and we learned a lot about how they get, give you that feeling that you are in this whole new world whilst you're there, the soundscapes that they create, the, the lighting design that they, that they create to be able to make you feel like you are in a snapshot of a film as you go around this space. I remember, uh, like, I've got a very vivid image that will forever be seared into my brain of legging it down an otherwise pitch black corridor following an actor. And as he ran down the corridor, he would hit these low hanging pendulums. And so each, uh, each light source swinging around kind of was cascading around. And so I was getting these kind of like flickerings of light and dark and light and dark as I followed him. It was, yeah, it was quite a cool image. So we tried to kind of uh, work a lot with with the lighting to kind of give an extra feel to the uh, to our room. So yeah, back to Brazil. So double whoop for Brazil. Um, in Brazil, uh, it is a kind of it, you know it's farcical. It's it's a dark comedy, I suppose. Um, the what was interesting. There's this. Um, idea they've created this semblance of a of an organized society they have these 
this facade of um, uh, kind of corporate smoothness, I suppose, um, you know, these big monolithic uh, interiors when you first walk into buildings. But behind the scenes of the buildings, it's kind of chaos of bureaucracy and uh, lots of, you know, we love pipes. Pipes are great. I mean, like anywhere we can stick more <laughs> pipes, we'll do that. But um, uh, it's effectively uh, the bureaucracy and the people that are creating the chaos in this society. So we're interested in that. So kind of any, um, all, all dystopias are something kind of system that was supposed to make things perfect that just went wrong. And uh, in Brazil, there's this system in place. People, if people are not filed properly, then they can potentially be disappeared by accident during like an administrative accident, which is kind of the central theme of the, uh, or central uh, motivation for, for the character. Um, and so we wanted to, give that feeling of a system that is in place that because humans are also in it, uh, they have, they've had to corrupt it because they, 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 were, they needed to bend the rules to, to be able to live within the system that they've been create that, uh, that exists. Uh, so one of the first characters that you meet when you play the game, so even before you've gone into the actual escape room itself, you've been introduced to the world and then you get pushed into this room and the wall is sealed behind you, there's no door, so you just have to talk to this person, interact with this character um, who is the secretary. The secretary is not having a good day, they've got a headache, they're really hungry and they just cannot be dealing with you right now. And so you have to figure out by talking to that character what it is that they want and what they need in order to allow you to actually into the room to play the game. So uh, you figure out from talking to her that she it needs, you've got food coupons and you can bribe her to go on a lunch break and stop protecting the room so that you can sneak in. So the very first thing before you even go into the room is you have become complicit in the corruption of this society. You have bribed someone in order to turn a blind eye. So you are already within that system and already Twist, twisting it in order to get a benefit from it. Um, this was inspired by the game Papers, Please, uh, which is a game where you play a border control agent and you're just doing your job, you're just trying to make enough money to feed your family and keep them alive. And the actual game itself on the surface looks quite simple. You get their travel papers and you have to m see if they match with what the government uh, uh, instructions are for who is allowed in and every day that goes by what the government demands is of people to be to allow them in changes and becomes more convoluted and conflicting and the people's stories that you of the people that you are assessing become quite heart-wrenching it's like oh, I just want to go across there because my baby is on the other side and you kind of like well I could just turn a blind eye and the idea of like this system is broken and is actually moral to play within the game if the game is forcing you to make choices that you don't agree with. And we, we wanted to try and give the audience that feeling of like, well, what do I actually feel inside this game? Like, do I feel comfortable with what I'm doing? And um, we were also looking and interested in the idea of how people um, kind of work together in a society that is, they're aware that the society is looking at them the whole time. And um, so the lives of others uh, is a brilliant example of, um, you know, the uh, DDR in the 1980s um, and the idea that uh, the, the establishment could be watching you at any time. Um, and so, uh, we used that, we had that as a, a kind of touchstone, but also uh, this game called Black Bar, which um, is uh, where we, you, sorry. Yeah, we have, we have a puzzle that directly homages Black Bar, um, which is another, again, very simple on the surface game. You, uh, you are reading the letters of, of somebody and those letters have been redacted by the government and you have to guess what those redacted words were. But as you play the game, you realize that there is, the, they're, they are finding ways around how to communicate around the system that's in place. 
Um, and also, so you're kind of reading between the lines to find out about the world that you are in and also how they've had to kind of uh, get messages out. So, yeah, sometimes the, the message implicit is deeper than the words that you're seeing there. And that was kind of uh, a bit of a theme throughout our game as well. So we, we also wanted, with that feeling of surveillance, we wanted to have at the heart of the world of New Pelagia, there is the JCN system, which is this huge computer system, uh, which we were calling Jason for short, who watches over everyone and makes sure that they're all working properly and efficiently within society. Um, if anyone can think of why it's called JCN, you get a little prize, Imagine high prize. five prize at the end of the session. Um, it's also just on a kind of you know basic level, uh, we wanted to create this JCN unit because old machines are just kind of there's like just an ugly beauty about them. All this old kind of tactile technology is just so wonderful to to play with and you know just look at. There's such a lot of craftsmanship that went into that. If you think about creating a kind of you know a, a sci-fi nowadays with puzzles that need to be solved, effectively a lot of puzzle solving could be done with just a small tap of a, a button. But um, that was kind of the reason why we wanted to step outside of uh, a convention or a contemporary uh, thought about sci-fi and go back to this retro uh, dystopia because big old ugly machines are just really fun to play with um, but it was interesting as well because uh, it kind of gave us uh, an insight into nowadays as well uh, one of the puzzles that we uh, used quite a lot in the game was typewriter and uh, just watching players we actually kind of noticed this uh, intergenerational divide which was quite a surprise of younger players weren't actually all that keen to get onto the typewriter and we realized after a while it was because some of the players hadn't touched a typewriter before or used it which made us feel quite old but <laughs> It was also quite fun to watch people play touch because like none of us have well very few of us will have used a typewriter quite recently and so there is a sort of novelty to like the, there was a sort of moment of delight on quite a lot of people's when they sat down and pressed the keys and heard that big ka-chunk noise and just the conscious like oh if you press the key harder the letter's darker <laughs> and 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 just the novelty as well and once you've run out of like how do we make it go back to the next line and people actually trying to remember how typewriters work uh, was just and it, there was a lot of excitement of playing with this essentially now this thing is a toy because it, we don't have manually func mechanically functioning things around us so much anymore um, and that was another thing that we really wanted to give people that thing like if you've got all of this uh, cool stuff to play with having moving parts is really satisfying we wanted to make uh, these objects feel satisfying to touch and to play with as well. Uh, so one of the objects that we've got in the room is the re-evaluation unit, uh, which when you first come to it, you don't know what it does. Um, and the more you play, you figure out, oh, it probably does this. And then when you actually physically touch it, you can kind of, it's got these switches that have these huge, these big clunky clicking noises. Um, and also the, the other thing is that you couldn't tell, like whilst all of the things in the room look very mechanical. There were actually small computers in a lot of things. So there are, there are two Arduinos inside this thing that actually control what it does and send a signal to the control room to tell, to tell control room that it, it, the puzzle had been completed. But you, um, you didn't actually, uh, um, you wouldn't think that there was computers inside a lot of the objects you were touching. Um, and uh, it, it, yes. And something else that, f from my point of view, that's very satisfying about kind of actually building escape rooms is, uh, so you have this kind of idea that you want to convey, and, and as, you know, I'm a, a designer, so I had aesthetics in mind a lot. Um, so I have an aesthetic in mind for this, but 
it also has a whole bunch of, um, when you create a machine like this, there is the user experience, like the feedback that they're getting. There is, so you need to think about that. Um, there is the, the kind of quite, in this instance, quite complex technology, um, a whole like rainbow of wires that are stuffed into the back of this machine. And then there is just the, the practicalities of, well, we need to get to the back of this machine. So how do we create an unlocking mechanism for the machine that, is, that cannot be even detected by the players in case they kind of go crazy and try and open it? And yeah, because as soon as you put a lock in the room, if they find the lock, they're going to want to unlock it because that's what the game is. So we would have to try and hide the manual access to reset the puzzles into the design as well, which is quite a design challenge. Um, but yeah, so this, uh, this the, uh, the, the, the big thing about this, this one was, um, and in fact, I'm going to go back to the last slide. Uh, thanks. Um, so all of the switches on this thing, some, as soon as somebody uh, went up to it and, and tested out, oh, can I, can I touch this? Can I play with it? They flick that switch on and, they'll, and it would light up. And as soon as they realize, like, oh, I can light this up, they would flick on all the switches, click, 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 click. And, and then someone else would go, like, I want to do that, and switch them all off again. And so they might just spend, and like, it, they weren't solving the puzzle at that moment, but they were just playing with it. And then they ultimately would be figuring out how to solve the puzzle. But mostly they just were playing with the toys, the clicky, clicky uh, switches. So um, yes, they, somebody would turn on all of the lights and uh, press all the switches and then hit that big button and it was just really satisfying to play with that object. Um, so that was uh, Escape from New Pelagia. So we're now going to talk about uh, a game which just we made which was actually quite different. Uh, so this is the Dyson Smart Room which, um, so New Pelagia was, was our, our own project. We made up that we want that, that story, that, that uh, world was our own and this project was for a client. So there's a lot of different considerations when it comes to designing a room for someone else. Um, and the other, like, the big part of this was that uh, Dyson doesn't have a story and it's kind of actually counter to their brand to tell stories. They are not a whimsical company. Um, so we were like, how can we tell the story of this brand? How can we tell the brand story of this through, this, through the, the experience that we created? Um, so Dyson are a British uh, product manufacturing company, but they're really known for their innovations. They work really hard. Um, they create these cool vacuum cleaners and um, these cool hair dryers, uh, sorry, hand dryers. And to put the word cool next to vacuum cleaner is quite an achievement, I think, but I think they've done it. Um, but they were looking at what the future is and, and where they can go. And they're thinking a lot about how they can combine digital with physical and uh, create items that can go into smart rooms and the internet of things. Yeah, so they, they were looking to move into a connected home internet of things and so they're opening up a new lab and they needed to hire people. So this, uh, this escape room was actually part of a recruitment uh, drive that they were doing and so they were looking for very specific uh, mindsets and skill sets which is actually uh, kind of n not what you normally have when you when you create an escape room you're generally trying to create a game that is open to as many different ways of thinking and different uh, kinds of people as possible uh, so going back to what our expectations for what the players are and what players will want and what we want from the players we actually could could uh, innovate ourselves here. We could change some of these things around. So uh, we decided to kind of flip the expectations. So if we're not, if we're not looking, if we can look for really specific skill sets, we could also innovate and do some some of our own experimentation on what the genre of an escape room is. So um, yeah. So we were talking about the expectations before. Um, what, what we decided to make changes here was the, um, you don't just, you don't have a series of rooms. We created one room that changes. Um, these people are gonna be, the Dyson are looking for very smart people who are um, 
you know, capable programmers, and uh, they wanted to test that. So interestingly, we were actually being kind of encouraging them to bring their knowledge into the game. Uh, the room is, um, was always listening, which we'll talk about more in a bit, minute. And uh, yeah, there, as Mink just said, there, is, there was no arc to the story. Um, so the room that we created was this sort of black box stage set. And instead of actually having objects in the room, we had these iconic representations of different room settings on, uh, drawn on the walls as line drawings using electroluminescent wire. Um, because we had the electroluminescent wire, we could layer up several different drawings over the stage set and just flick the switch and flick between the different wires to create a different room. So this is how we had our players stayed in the same room, but we changed what the room was and what puzzles they were dealing with around them. We kind of morphed it around them. So it was a holodeck. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like a holodeck, objects could appear and disappear and uh, different things became useful. Um, oh. so, yeah, and it, it kind of looked, looked like, like Tron. Tron. Um, so the, the idea of having a room that swapped around was, was, we were both very inspired when we saw the play The Curious Instant of the Dog in the Nighttime, um, which if you get a chance to see it, it's touring around the world, so if you get a chance to see this play, you really should. The staging is amazing. Um, it's this, they, they project onto the walls and change what is, on, what is the scenery as the actors are on the stage. Uh, they even have like physical blocks that push out from the floor, from the walls, from the ceiling. Uh, there's one point on the, along the back wall, some blocks push out so that the player is able to use it like a staircase and walk up the, uh, the back wall. And it was, just, it's such a, it was such a kind of inspirational way of doing um, almost like Brechtian empty room, but actually having it be really interactive. Um, and now, w the other thing that we could swap around was uh, the sense of the expectation of a timer. So most escape rooms, not all of them, but generally most escape rooms are 60 minutes long, and the, play the, team, the players are trying to solve a string of puzzles, all of the content, all of the puzzles within that time limit as fast as they can. So if you're doing really well, then you'll have spent even less time in the room than someone else. So uh, this is kind of, it's in some ways, it's kind of like you're not really getting your money's worth if you're actually good at the game, um, but, uh, which is maybe a slightly cynical way of looking at that. Uh, so instead of having like the 60 minute timer that some people will come out with quicker, we wanted to have every single team, because they're all being assessed as well, like are they gonna be, like they should all get a fair chance. So every team would have exactly the same amount of time in the room, which was 45 minutes. And if you, because we had this modular system, um, two teams could potentially complete one room. Um, you do not need to read all of this, but this is just like, so we had a, the, the flow was not as linear as uh, it, it loops back around. Um, if, uh, so teams would start out in one room, say the living room. If they solved all of those puzzles, then they would get moved on to the kitchen or the uh, bedroom um, and then finally the garage. So if you, uh, two teams potentially could have spent exactly the same amount of time solving one puzzle, so solving one room, but instead of using that time limit as to judge how well they did, we gave, we attributed points to different things that they were doing in that room. Um, so you can kind of see, so the, the modular nature of it, like so these rooms all, were all in this, that space at the same time and it was a bit of a, a four dimensional jigsaw puzzle to try and fit all those puzzles in there but not have them overlap each other. And uh, the puzzles themselves were, um, as we were saying, based around uh, the internet of things and uh, so we were tasking the teams to look at all of the stages that go into connecting something, an, an object. Uh, so using the programming, uh, figuring out what it is that the, the kind of theoretical user is, requires and how you communicate that message. Um, and then, you know, also playing with objects as well. Um, 
So we were actually, the puzzles were quite hard. Um, uh, so, and they were all themed around the Internet of Things. Um, this one, the home from work puzzle, uh, was using the, the idea of, uh, so they had have to be kind of aware of the idea of if this, then that recipes. So, uh, which were um, a way, which are the kind of like glue that stick together Internet of Things connected objects. So, say, if, uh, if I am leaving home because my car has told, uh, my car knows that I'm driving I'm this far away, then put on the oven because the oven should be warmed up for when I get home. Things like that. That kind of if this, then that recipe. And uh, so we kind of, the, the challenges were not as straightforward and, and as obvious as, as to what you're supposed to do because one of the puzzles was figuring out what the puzzle was. Um, which is a, a design challenge. Um, uh, my, my background is uh, I've uh, studied product design, and so the idea of like having to find out what the user needs and what you're supposed to actually be solving is a big part of what it is to, to try and create consumer products. Um, and with that in mind, the point system that we gave with the criteria by which we were judging people, uh, the points along the side there, the top one is critical thinking, which is can you actually figure out what the problem is that you're trying to be solving, not just can you solve it. Uh, some of the other the, the categories that we've got here is determination, it's the one at the bottom, which was kind of a way that we could reward people for if they, not necessarily doing the right thing, but they were trying really hard. Like they were just testing and testing and testing. Because if you, you it, that's the kind of, that's something you want to be looking for. Like uh, if you, if you will, are willing to try and try and try and fail, but keep trying, then that's a sign of a good designer. So we could award them determination points and up their score for trying really hard um, and, and not giving up. And then there was also uh, ingenuity points. So the ingenuity points we put in so that like, if they were clever enough to solve our puzzles and they could come up with cool ideas to figure out what the puzzle was, then that's great. But if they managed to think up stuff that we didn't even think of, if they solved a problem in a way that was just like, wow, that's clever, you're cleverer than us, which is hopefully a good, like you should be because <laughs> we're not uh, engineers. Uh, so we could actually award them points for thinking outside of the box and being cleverer than the game, um, which I think would be a nice thing if lots of games could do. <laughs> uh, and then the last one. We was had, um, yeah, communication, which uh, was for us, for me, really exciting. This is, um, this is because we had two really interesting things that we were trying out um, with uh, players communicating. And the first was um, the smart room itself communicating with the room. So, so there was, we had like a, and, and you couldn't really have an Internet of Things thing without having like an Alexa or Siri type personal assistant. Um, so we had um, the smart room itself could talk to you uh, in the same way that you might just say, Alexa, play the music. You could say smart room. I'm listening. <laughs> um, and we had this voice who would, would respond to you and would answer questions or, uh, or, or, or set off instructions um, in the same way that a Siri or Alexa can, can do that for you. Um, so uh, we had the voice actress, Sam Ahrens, who was uh, listening to what the players were asking for and talking to her. And she, she kind of had quite a, a sassy personality, we found out, the, the smart room, the, the Dyson version of a, of a Siri. Um, and uh, it, was, it was quite a nice thing as well because um, in a lot of escape rooms, people don't like to feel like they are be, that they're not good enough to solve the puzzles themselves, and that asking game control for help is, is, is something to be not proud of. So what was actually really nice about the fact that they had this character in the room that they were talking to naturally anyway and chatting to was it meant that they actually would, would talk to game control a lot more fluidly than in a lot of other escape rooms where it's kind of like jarring and slightly outside of the game to be like, oh, we're not doing well, let's ask for a clue. Um, because they were already talking to smart rooms, they were happy to ask and get help from game control as well. They quite often just stop for a chat or, <laughs> you know, to see if smart room had any jokes and things like that. It was quite a lovely feeling. Uh, but the other, the other interesting part and, and smart room, the voice was 
an interesting aspect of this was it was also a conduit to the wider audience, which was um, which was uh, the Twitch audience. So this was being live streamed, um, and Twitch uh, were kind of by the end of the, the the event, they were getting very engaged. We had a whole bunch of dedicated people helping the players in various ways. Um, so we had actually, or Mink had worked on something before, uh, which was involved. Uh, so uh, just briefly, one of the other escape rooms that we made for the Alibi TV channel was um, actually broadcast on Facebook Live, and the audience who were like, writing in the comments were the only people playing. So the person who was actually in the room was uh, an actor with a camera um, and, and a, a voice actor who was like, having a sort of inner monologue that the, that the viewing audience could hear and talk to. Um, so every time they wrote a comment, they would just be saying, go over there, look at this thing. And they were kind of chatting amongst themselves to solve the puzzles. And then he would go and do what they told him to do. Uh, so, uh, uh, and they could also send like a little emoticon faces to vote for th the things as well. Um, so this was it, was, it was kind of a different experience because that the actor was in the room, we had control over the actor who wasn't, didn't have agency, he wasn't trying to solve the puzzles himself, he was just doing what he was, what the, the actual aud playing audience wanted uh, to solve. Um, this, yeah, in this one, they ha we had the actual players in the room were the main people trying to solve the puzzles. So the, the remote viewing audience was, was actually, they just were there to help. Um, and observe, they had puzzles themselves that they were kind of looking at, which were the players couldn't actually necessarily look at for the entire duration. So the Twitch audience were pretty vital there. But the way that the players, apart from by speaking to s Smart Room, the way that the players uh, could communicate to, with Twitch was uh, we worked with digital artist Sam Ray um, on creating the altar to Twitch, uh, which was where the players could bring objects or questions that they'd written down on pieces of paper um, to this, uh, this altar here. And they'd lay them down, and uh, uh, Smart Room would ask Twitch to conduct a poll. Uh, so whoever, whichever um, got the most number of votes, the players could take that as being the answer. And so we, we wrote a couple of puzzles that actually required you to use this. But in general, it was just another thing that the players had at their disposal to use. Like they, they could at any point choose to run a poll on anything. They could write down four words and put them on there. They knew that Twitch could hear them and see them, so they could, they could, ask, they could, they could use this as at any point. But uh, this puzzle in particular, they, uh, one of the, the challenges was make a light change color to be Twitch's favorite color when it hears a lullaby played. And so there's like, well, how are we supposed to know what Twitch's favorite color is? It's like, well, you go and do market research by finding four colored objects in the room and placing them on an altar and, and kind of praying to Twitch to tell you. Uh, so um, in this particular instance, Twitch's favorite color was green. Um, so, and we've got a video. No, not for Twitch. Oh, did it not work? No, no, for the, the puzzles. For the puzzles, yeah. yeah. So this is just uh, this is an example of um, if you have a whole bunch of uh, very smart folks who know programming in the room, how do you make programming slightly more complex for them? And the answer is uh, you create programming Jenga. So we wrote a code uh, that was theoretically would work in Scratch, which looks, it's, if it's programming language for children, so it kind of looks like Jenga blocks already. So, uh, so actually writing them on the blocks and then putting the blocks inside a giant computer and giving them only one hand each was kind of the idea, like, you should really check with other people what your code is and work together as a team. Um, so quite a lot of, sort of visual metaphors. <laughs> For programming here. It was, um, <laughs> and it was kind over. of tragic to watch though. <laughs> they could get right to the end and see the whole dream disappear in their hands. 
Um, so, oops. You get to see the behind the scenes. So yeah, um, that's that. That's the two projects. Um, and and like the the main thing that we really got out of we've gotten out of all of the escape rooms that we've made is just the. The, the, the unique experience of actually watching people play your game, being part of the game, and they can't see you, they don't know you're there, but they, they, uh, they still kind of know that you're present in that you're, you're the characters that you're playing. Um, and uh, the, the most exciting thing is just watching people congratulate each other and, and say like, oh, it's amazing that you did that, and, and cheering when they solve a puzzle or unlock a lock. And it's just really, really rewarding to watch people play these games and just really enjoy them. So that's kind of our...